Welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, the Executive Director of Speaking of Women's Health, and I am so glad to be back in the Sunflower House. We have a special edition of this podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Alexa Fifik. You may remember her from last season. Uh, we interviewed her, Dr. Fifik is terrific, last year. She is now a physician in concierge practice in Westlake, Ohio, after finishing her two-year specialized women's health fellowship. She's a board-certified family medicine physician, and she's now providing concierge membership care with a focus on prevention and well-being. And Dr. Fifik provides exceptional care to all of her patients with um, a special interest in midlife women and beyond, and providing a care to all of her patients, including men um, and women. So she's joining us on this episode to discuss the dangers of hormonal pellets in women and the truth about unregulated hormones. Welcome, Dr. Fifik. Hi, Dr. Thacker. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, it's great to see you. And you've got such a lovely practice. I really enjoyed being at the grand opening. And you're also on social media. Where can people follow you on social media? Yeah, so you can find us at CMO Westlake on both Instagram and uh, Facebook, as well as I also keep a personal sort, more, sort of directed more towards education Instagram at Dr. Fifik. Um, so both places you can find me. Well, that's terrific. And you've been doing a lot of things in the community as well recently. Um, I know you were spearheading up uh, awareness in heart disease in women. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so I was uh, elected one of the 2024 Go Red for Women's Women of Impact uh, this year for the campaign. And um, part of that, I have been very interested in spreading some of the information about uh, heart health in women, especially how it is um, so intertwined with menopause and perimenopause, um, as well as fundraising for uh, furthering research in women's heart health. So that's been really fun. Well, that's terrific. And for any of our listeners, if you missed my February podcast on uh, matters of the heart and gender, um, please go back and listen to that because heart disease is the leading cause of death for Americans, both men and women. So we've missed you at the Center for Specialized Women's Health, but we certainly um, are glad to hear that everything is going great in your new concierge uh, practice. And I understand that a lot of people who come to visit you are specifically interested in these unregulated hormone pellets. So I thought it would be really great to take this episode to talk about the dangers of unregulated hormones. Certainly, it's not good to be hormonally deficient but it's not good to kind of overdose on um, hormonal substances that are very potent. And we want to talk about what the options and what, what's available, what women should look out for if they've kind of been ensnared in these practices that charge a lot of money for pellets. And, and then from what I see, from my perspective, don't even follow these women and then they, they just have all these problems. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so after the publication of the Women's Health Initiative, which is, gosh, it'll be this summer, it will be 22 years. Certainly attitudes um, yeah. have changed related to treating menopausal symptoms. I've always been the same. <laughs> I didn't change. I remember some of my fellows that have since graduated, they like must have looked at me kind of strangely back then thinking like they didn't quite believe me because the whole narrative was so negative to hormones. And then later, once they were in their practice and as you know, more publications came out, they're like, geez, you were really right. <laughs> It's like, yes. Um, so just because things are in the media doesn't mean that it's correct. That's for sure. And you would think post-pandemic, yeah. everybody would realize that. Um, so there's been all this attention about BHT, bioidentical hormones. We have celebrities and media that many times promote misconceptions. So many standard yeah. physicians won't even treat women. A lot of OBGYNs, primary care doctors, endocrinologists. and so. I mean, like, where is a woman to turn? Um, so 
tell us about these implants and are they safe and effective and, and what are you seeing? Yeah, so um, to start start from the end of that question and work back forward, um, my side of town over here on the west side, um, I'm not sure if it's, it's quite as different from maybe the east side or the middle portions of greater Cleveland, but um, my, my side of town has been seeing a lot of uptick in pellet use. Um, I am finding them everywhere from clinicians to I'm not so sure they're actually getting them from clinicians. And uh, so, it's so a question that spas or fly by night yeah, places I, I, or I, I have I have concern that people are getting them from potentially either Medi spas or um, or clinics that are not uh, run by clinicians that are quite as uh, up to date with their licensure or some of those other things. Hmm. Um, so. It, I feel like there's been an, a really significant uptick recently, specifically in maybe the last like six, nine months. Um, and I, I assume that is partially attributable to the people on my side of town in my neighborhoods advertising um, for these things and partially because of the rap it's getting on social media and media. Um, so pellets in and of themselves, um, if you don't know what they are, they are a subcutaneous or under the skin implant that is inserted with a small, slightly larger than a blood draw needle device. Um, and we insert them there in order to, by theory, have slower secretion of hormones. Um, what has been touted as kind of the, uh, average time frame that things go in and then wear off is that those hormones go in, peak around the end of the first month, and then by the end of the third to sixth month are again depleted. Um, and one of the major problems that those of us who are not proponents for pellets um, is that it's not FDA regulated. And what I mean by that is not that there aren't issues that patients bring to me regularly about things with the FDA for other medications. We all know in the menopause world um, that it is difficult to get medications approved by the FDA. Um, but what that means is that these have never been tried in major studies in women or men for that matter. Um, and so we don't have any safety data. We don't have any data about uh, how long it takes for them to build up and wear down, what sort of levels we should be aiming for for safety purposes or dosing information. So when you go to one of these clinics that are doing this, um, because it's not FDA approved, it is a cash pay only option. And approximately um, what are you so seeing that people are paying? I'm just curious how much money people are wasting. Honestly, anywhere from about four hundred dollars, I've seen as high as a grand to about twelve hundred for a single encounter. Um, and the majority of the recommendations, I I said just a moment ago that it may take theoretically up to six months for that to wear off. Um, and I'll circle back to that because that part's super important in my opinion. Um, what the recommendations from these clinicians that are doing it is that. Um, you get levels checked right before you come in for your pellet. Um, they give you a quote unquote proprietary dose, um, depending on what brand they're choosing. Um, I hate the word proprietary because it typically, in my opinion, is sneaky. Yes. Um, and then they give you this quote unquote proprietary dose. Have you come back and play that game again every three to four months? Um, and what you end up doing then is paying cash for these labs. A lot of these pellet people are doing Dutch testing or saliva testing, which is also not approved. And we have no validated evidence that it works. Um, and then you're paying cash, not only for the service fee of having that clinician insert those pellets, um, but then the cash for the actual medication, quote unquote, itself. Um, so those are kind of the main high points of that. Um, from a safety perspective, if we want to get into that a little bit, um, what we're seeing for a lot of people is because we don't know how these, uh, doses work and how they absorb over time or immediately in patients, we're seeing a lot of what we consider supra 
therapeutic doses. So we see ranges of estrogen and testosterone in these female patients that are so super high above what we would even have premenopausally, or I've seen crazy ones that are above where you would even have estrogen in pregnancy, um, that that's when we start seeing the repercussions of those super high levels. Um, I'm sure Dr. Thacker, and I know for a fact, based on when we were working together, um, you have seen some really crazy high numbers um, in these patients with pellets that I've never seen with any other form of hormone therapy in my entire career. Um, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, you were talking about this Dutch testing, which seems to be really popular amongst really cool uh, functional medicine people. And I know that a lot of functional medicine people are in the cash pay field, which makes sense if you're outside of a, an employed setting and you want to spend more time with patients. So not all services that are requesting cash up front for your time and expertise are necessarily bad. But I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on why we don't do Dutch testing, even though there are people in this functional medicine field, even those that are that are um, certified and even in, in employment situations that aren't doing cash base are still falsely promoting this. And then I also wanted you to touch on like, what's the, what are the advertisements? Like I haven't seen any advertisements that's hooking women in to coming in and getting these unregulated hormones. Yeah. So going back to the Dutch test. Um, so Dutch testing, like I mentioned previously, is basically saliva-based testing. And um, it's something that we don't have any evidence is helpful at all. There's also versions of the testing that goes along with the saliva testing, which is urine. Um, so the reason that doctors like Dr. Thacker and I don't find them helpful and honestly, probably useless and expensive um, is because getting hormone levels in blood is an extremely uh, finicky thing. We know that um, when you're in perimenopause, those levels fluctuate pretty rapidly. Um, and so anytime that we do a blood level of for example, estrogen and FSH, the, the hormone from the brain that tells the ovary to do its job. Um, we are only getting essentially a 10 minute snapshot of what that hormone level is. So it's not even the same 10 minutes later, um, let alone what you could potentially catch in saliva. Additionally, um, NAMs and multiple other um, uh, bodies have historically, you know, noted that the level in blood doesn't also always equal what shows up as being bound to the receptors that are doing the work. So there's a lot of times as well that people get blood work done and say, oh, hey, your levels are low, your levels are high. In reality, that doesn't match what the medication um, is doing for them systemically. Um, so another thing about the Dutch testing being not covered by insurance and cash pay only, we're looking at the order of usually the number I get thrown is $400 or $500 for one of these tests, um, only to give us completely unreliable information that you can't make a decision based off of. Um, I get the draw because not everybody likes needles, and you can do some of these things in your home and send them in with these kits, um, which is a new thing for younger women for fertility and thyroid and a whole slew of totally useless things. Um, and I, and I understand that, but it's not worth your time or money. Um, as far as advertising goes for both kind of Dutch testing and pellets goes, um, that sort of non-invasive, um, component of the Dutch testing, I've seen advertisements for, um, that way. And, uh, as far as pellets go specifically, the words that get thrown around a lot are what to me appears to be repercussions of the WHI. Um, so natural, safer, um, the bioidentical term, all of these we know are basically invalid claims um, because the hormones that uh, were used in the WHI um, were synthetic, but so are anything else that are being in a lab, made in a lab. Um, I like to make the joke with my patients that um, when I'm talking about bioidentical hormones, I'm talking about the compounds that are as close as what your body makes as I can get it in a lab. 
because I can't take your ovaries out and juice them. So, <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. You you just cannot say that something is more natural or more organic or safer if it has to go through the same production processes. Um, and so I've seen a lot of advertisements about safer, um, organic, more natural, um, which is just not the case. So you have been listening to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, and we're having a very interesting discussion with women's health expert and concierge medicine expert, Dr. Alexa Fifik of Concierge Medicine of Westlake. And we are talking about uh, these pellets, uh, high doses of unregulated hormones that are being pushed off as being so safe and so natural and so perfect. Uh, and unfortunately they're really not. So, I mean, anytime anyone makes any claim that something is a hundred percent safe and a hundred percent effective, they're, they're just not telling the truth. And, uh, it's amazing how some of these magical terms like natural and organic and, uh, just for you and individualized all sounds so good. And it's amazing how media and marketing and, um, the television or uh, just however someone gets their social media, whether it's Instagram, wherever, can be so hypnotizing. And it's amazing how people can get sucked into a false uh, narrative. So, Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's a lot of things that we do that aren't FDA approved. And I think us relying on, well, it's not FDA approved, unfortunately, these days doesn't always hold water. And we use all sorts of other products that are FDA approved for other things that we use them, quote, off label. Um, And so that's really where clinical judgment uh, comes in. So how are patients coming to you? Are they asking you for pellets or are they just tired of paying the excessive doses? Are they coming in because they're having terrible side effects, growing a beard and dropping the upper octaves of their voice? Uh, Honestly, all of the above. Uh, In the beginning of kind of the wave of people that I think were a little bit more interested in it, um, would honestly call my office and ask if I did pellets or bioidentical hormones, um, to which um, obviously I have trained my staff to kind of politely answer and and work around. Um, And there has been also uh, what I've seen, I think, a little bit more lately, partially the this is really expensive. I wonder if there's an alternative or this is expensive. I'm fine with it, but I'm having side effects that I want to figure out. Um, and so, um, I think this is a a pretty solid segue to talk about what these side effects are and what these risks of these super high doses are. Um, one of the ones that, uh, is really common as Dr. Thacker said is, um, seeing things like our voices dropping as women with that excess testosterone, Um, Other things that I like to tell my patients, think of those jocks that you knew in college or high school that were juicing with testosterone. Those are the things we're seeing. We're seeing mood changes, acne, hair growth on your chin, chest, um, other masculinizing places, as well as hair loss on your head. Um, But what is not as obvious to patients um, without those kind of physical markers Um, is that we can see a lot of changes from a metabolic perspective with excess um, or super physiologic testosterone. Um, And so changes in our cholesterol panels, um, worsening of metabolic syndrome markers. My big problem with this is with pellets, we don't know how long it takes things to kind of wear off. So even if you stop doing the pellets, you don't get a new, you know, insertion. I don't really know how long those things are going to linger. Um, as far as growth of the clitoris and voice change, we know those are permanent changes that can never be undone. Um, but I, we don't know if you have changes in your cholesterol, if you develop metabolic syndrome or type two diabetes, I don't know if that's going to be undoable, um, just by waiting out to see if the testosterone wears off. Um, And one that I hadn't mentioned yet for women who still have a uterus is that testosterone in the body when it's in excess converts itself to estrogen. Um, And so what we often see with these pellets is these really, really high doses of testosterone potentially included with estrogen and or progesterone, sometimes not. Um, And in either case, when we have excess, excess testosterone making estrogen, 
um, without significant protection of the uterus, you can get thickening of the endometrial lining that can become cancer. Um, and so unfortunately, one of the side effects that we tend to find women doing poorly on pellets is that they come in bleeding and we find out that they have endometrial cancer. I think every clinician in the menopause world who isn't a pellet provider um, ends up doing um, some sort of workup and finding endometrial cancer in their time. Um, and so th that is some of the main reasons that we have have some issues with pellets. You know, sex hormones are so potent. Um, and I would encourage anyone to who hasn't listened to my podcast, The Cleveland Clinic Guide to Menopause. I updated the book last year at the very beginning of the first season uh, that we have lots of chapters and specifics on hormones. I also did a separate podcast on why bioidentical hormones aren't necessarily better, but we can certainly prescribe them if people only want the exact chemical structure of estrogen and progesterone. Um, <clears throat> but it's interesting that people identify the word synthesized as negative, but obviously any substance that's pharmaceutical, that's ingested, applied, injected, inserted, et cetera, in the body isn't just grabbed out of the grass or nature, or like you said, right. someone else's ovaries. Now, they used to take animal gonads and crush them up and inject them into women hundreds of years ago before they had purified hormones. So I just think a lot of basic education uh, people need to go back to, but certainly because the sex hormones are so potent, people who are hormonally deficient, who get a big burst of high doses of hormones... I mean, wow. I mean, it's just like sometimes how people feel like when they're put on high doses of steroids or glucocorticoids. Some people feel crazy and miserable, but some people feel like I can just take on the world. I, I just feel like I'm 20 again. And so I imagine that there is like that hormonal rush um, or like almost addiction, not in the classic sense, but in the tacky phylaxis sense. When I see yeah. women, usually they're tired of paying the money. They realize that whoever is providing these, um, isn't even examining them or paying attention to any other aspect of their health. And that's a big tip off. Um, I always mm -hmm. ask about, well, if it's a physician, what is their background? I mean, some of these people are people that were like maybe emergency room physicians who just didn't want to work for a hospital anymore, you know, or it's not even their field. It's, it's not even like they re were remotely trained. Some of them are in the GYN field and they're just trying to increase the cash business. And I think that's so unfortunate because they're really exposing these women to virilizing side effects and uterine cancer and potentially increased cardiovascular risk because of the masculinizing hormones. So, you know, adults can do what they want with their body as long as it's not, you know, against the law per se, but I just don't think people are getting informed consent. And I think so many women are being taken advantage I of. I agree. I think um, I was recently part of a, a, a educational discussion with a bunch of other physicians, um, and I understand why women are seeking these answers, right? We talk about this all the time. There are not enough menopause-trained clinicians in the United States, um, and it makes sense to me that they're looking for answers. If they're going to their other clinicians and they're being brushed off or told, oh, it's natural, just suck it up. Um, and I wish that wasn't a quote, but that's a quote that I've heard. Um, I, I get where they're coming from. I have a really big issue with um, clinicians and other potential people that are discussing these things or selling these things. Um, because I agree, I don't think patients are getting informed consent to what is actually occurring. It gets sold as natural, organic, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it seems very exciting. Patients start these uh, pellets and like you said, immediately seem to get these crazy increases in energy and mood and my hat flashes are gone, blah, blah, blah. But we, we see kind of from an uh, uh, observational perspective as clinicians is that um, something called tachyphylaxis can develop over time, meaning that you keep giving doses and doses and doses to these receptors, and then they stop outputting as big of an outcome. And so um, over time, a lot, I see a lot of patients go really great upswing, feeling amazing on top of the world, 
please, dear God, don't ever take my pellets away from me to plummeting and going, I'm still doing these. My lovers levels are still high or they say it's fine and I don't feel good. Um, or the reverse happens and kind of, they still are always sort of chasing that high. Um, and, and without the education of one that could happen or two, these bad side effects that concern us could happen. Um, a lot of patients just end up paying hand over fist cash money in order to either find out why they can't hit that high anymore or chasing that high forever. So are you seeing other um, practices in these pe people that are being pushed uh, to get the pellets, like these O shots and vaginal rejuvenation and a lot of other shady cash practices without really any long-term outcomes or any even basic evidence? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think they kind of go hand in hand with a lot of the clinics that do them. Um, and again, from an advertising perspective, and now as someone who is a business owner, I understand um, they play into what people are looking for, right? If you can't go to your doctor and immediately say, hey, like my libido has changed, my vagina is dry, I'm having crazy hot flashes, and get an answer, um, there are these places which you click immediately, they are, they pay a lot of money to get at the top of your Google search. And I promise you those top three to five are probably paying to be there. Um, and immediately say all the things that you want to hear. Oh, Hey, we have this amazing, you know, shot. It's one and done or five and done, and it's going to cure your libido, or it's going to make you have the best orgasm of your life. And you're going to stop sweating, lose weight, feel great, be on top of the moon, run for president, whatever they're telling you. Um, and, and it, it buys people in because there's not enough of us to give straightforward answers. As soon as they start advertising this unscrupulous way, they're going to be getting patients. And, and do you think that any of these people are being reported to medical boards at all? Because when I see these disasters, like women who aren't even in menopause being treated with pellets for their fatigue, which is because they have cancer or undiagnosed diabetes or untreated yeah. sleep disorders and fibromyalgia or obvious vitamin deficiencies or other untreated medical disorders, which makes the women feel like crap that need to be addressed and treated. And it just doesn't seem like there's any outcome. I, I have not yet seen any major repercussions in all honesty. I, I do think that sometime in my career, we're going to see some crackdown on it, but, um, Unfortunately, I have to say, uh, cynically, my opinion is that because it is more of a women's health issue, um, that there's not as much attention given to it as there probably should be. Um, and I, I'm waiting for that shoe to drop so that patients who have had negative outcomes um, really are able to advocate for themselves and say, hey, this like never should have been done. Like, let's investigate these people that are doing these things. Mm -hmm. Now, when I've seen women and I've gotten levels, and a lot of times these are women who are already due for their next pellet, so supposedly they should be more at a trough level, and I'm getting hormone levels, I rarely see any measurable estrogen, which is what most postmenopausal women need, and I see super physiologic levels like, you know, androgen, poisoning, toxicity levels, sometimes even higher than a man, Um so I'm wondering, how do, you, how, how do you follow these people? What do you advise? What therapies do you give them in, in replacement of trying to get them off of this terrible hormonal roller coaster? Yeah, I've seen, um, I've seen it actually both ways. I've seen a lot of people who are extremely um, deficient in estrogen when I meet them at that three, four, six month mark when they were like due for a pellet. Um, and still seeing some pretty high testosterones. I've seen it the other way too, um, that the estrogen is still really, really high at that point out, um, which makes me then curious, how high were you when it was at its theoretical peak level? Um, if you're coming to me in your pregnancy range now at four months out, what were you before? Um, and so one of the things, because that kind of estrogen deficiency looking number um, is a little bit more common, kind of waiting, honestly, to see how that testosterone decreases over time um, and going to one of the more FDA regulated and um, NAMS recommended uh, medication options for the estrogen progestin um, replacement therapy. So typically um, what that looks like for me is 
seeing those immediate levels, plus minus the uterus, they either, you know, get with progestin or without, um, and then following them up around the six week to 12 week mark. Um, I have seen some really crazy ones now come back where they were, I mean, if thousands, high hundreds, thousands, um, but both testosterone and estrogen and even checking them three, four months later, like they're still not normal yet. Um, so I think that's, that's the hard part is there's no guidelines for this because there's no data for this. So I don't know what your, uh, kind of habits are clinically now, Dr. Thacker, but I found it actually pretty hard to gauge steps unless I'm just kind of sitting and watching and waiting with my patients for things to decline over time. Well, there's no real way unless you excise the pellet, um, they're going to have that continued exposure. And I tell them that if they have an endometrium or, you know, a uterus, but even if they've had a hysterectomy because of endometriosis, that they're at increased risk for endometrial cancer. And that, that persists. And I published a series of cases of women with uterine cancer who had just been on, not pellets, but just unregulated compounded hormones. And they were women that didn't have typical risk factors like obesity, diabetes, uh, nulliparity, never having a child. And so women that had no family history or increased risk of uterine cancer developing uterine cancer, even after just six months to a year of unregulated hormones. So yeah. it, it, it that is a big concern, and, and I have to emphasize that to patients. They have to be followed. Um, <clears throat> I usually see levels go down within three months, um, and I always inquire for other sources of androgens, like are they taking over-the-counter DHEA, because uh, sometimes they're told to do that. Um, is their partner rubbing mm -hmm. testosterone on their skin and then hugging them and transferring that testosterone? Uh, you know, occasionally we will find adrenal or ovarian tumors, um, if those levels still stay high, but mm -hmm. I give women a higher than average dose of continuous estrogen and give them adequate progesterone treatment. And many times we'll just do an endometrial biopsy, uh, and or serial, uh, ultrasound monitoring on them. And I tend to find out that a lot of these people have neurotransmitter problems. And that's part of the reason of them being addicted to extra sex hormones. Like when a lot of women say, oh, my hormones are off, they really mean their neurotransmitters are off. And mm -hmm. so lots of people have sleep disorders, untreated depression, vitamin deficiencies. And so I find that rarely have women ever even been evaluated for any of these things or medication side effects. They were put on a medicine for one thing and one thing led to another as well as just terrible lifestyles. I mean, ingesting refined yeah. carbohydrates and seed oils and highly processed foods and not getting enough sleep and just expecting their 50 plus year old body to act like it did when they were 20 is just not realistic. Um, so yeah. I do a lot of just kind of goal setting as well as evaluation. Um, and there are some women who do feel better with high normal female levels of testosterone. And so I, I tell them that if you need mm -hmm. testosterone, even though it's not FDA approved, I will use it off label, but That's with fine. a pharmacist yeah. that I can trust to mix it up and with appropriate monitoring. And they have to accept the fact that if they have end organ um, effects in skin and hair or voice, which sometimes can happen depending on if you're genetically predisposed, that that's the something that they have to accept. And um, of course you're, you being much more of a hair person than myself, <laughs> you know, most of the patients we see women, if they have to pick the sex life or the hair, they pick the hair and we have non-hormonal yeah. ways to help the sex, sex life. Um, certainly like phlebanserine Addy and Vilesi injectable bromalinotide and off-label low-dose Wellbutrin, and obviously just rehabilitating the vagina from hormone deficiency with vaginal DHEA or yeah. vaginal estrogen can be really life-changing. And I always like to separate sex from the vagina because everybody needs a healthy GU system. Everybody needs a bladder. And it, it's disappointing to me that people who come to see me for sex and I get them on a good regimen and their sex life is better, they just throw away the program be, when they're not sexually active, which is is not how you should view your whole body and, you know, your whole hormonal yeah. status. Uh, but in a lot of these people who've had super physiologic doses of hormones that are kind of addicted or have that tacky phylaxis, I use a lot of low dose 
bupropion, wellbutrin to boost dopamine, the feel good mm-hmm. neurotransmitter. And that helps me bridge to get them onto a stable, uh, stable program. But I think that mm-hmm. when you just prescribe a standard medicine that's been around for 50 years, that's been well regulated, and we have ideas about purity and content and, and organ effects, it's not really sexy because you're not mixing up some special concoction. And certainly things have mm-hmm. to be individualized. And sometimes we do have to compound if it's not commercially available, but compounding isn't better. It's just less mm-hmm. regulated. So, you know, do you yeah. want to go eat food at a restaurant that's been inspected and has good reviews and has been checked out by the health department? Or do you just want to go to some fly by night place that who knows how they're preparing the food or what they're adding to it, or if they've washed their hands? So that's kind yeah. of another way I try to describe that t- to women. But um, I also try to set. I think that's a really good analogy. I, I try to set guidelines too about what sexual function should be because a lot of times women just have unrealistic expectations based on what they see in the media or what they think their friends are saying or what they're reading in novels. And so I do think women are excessively hard on themselves on so many, oh, yeah. on so many levels. Oh, yeah. I think um, one of the ones that you kind of pointed out um, among that was um, there is a role for testosterone in sexual health. And a lot of us in the menopause world really believe that it can be used for a lot of other things. Um, But if we're going to do it, it's not coming through a pellet. Um, And and, um, unfortunately, it's an area of... uh, data it, or like Dr. Bator always calls it a data free zone. Um, it's a data free zone because we don't have a ton of data on, you know, the risks or benefit in women. Um, however, many of us are going to try really hard to use a safer version of it if you do in fact need it. Um, which yeah, to answer your former question of like, what do you do with these people? Um, a lot of times I do end up having to add in a little bit of testosterone. Um, after the fact, after we've got them on a solid dose of estrogen, we've got our progesterone, you know, rocking and rolling as well. Um, and so it, women are not wrong to pursue kind of um, feeling better and having better sex lives, but understanding what you're dealing with from a risk versus benefit perspective. And then, and, and knowing what, what is normal um, society and media for centuries um, have have really done women a disservice in what sexual health should look like for women. So yeah, we see it on both ends, right? The woman who's like, I don't really need anything for my vagina. It's a little dry, but like pain during sex only happens sometimes. I don't really need it. And then the people that and want it and need it all the time. Um, in reality, everyone's much more in the middle of those two things. So I think, again, educating patients to know those normals and those kind of ranges um, is really, really crucial. And so your answer when people call up, like, do you do bioidentical hormones? It's yes, but it's regulated and it's appropriate and it's monitored and it's not like the wild, wild west of injecting pellets of, you know, who knows what. Do you even know where these... uh, people are getting the pellets? Are they getting them compounded by a pharmacist? I'm just wondering. Yeah. So some of them um, come from larger compounding um, companies. Like, I don't know how you pronounce it, BioT, BioTe. Um, there's a couple like those. It does seem that there are a couple clinicians um, that are getting them like custom compounded. Um, and I don't know where that pharmacy is. Um, in all honesty, I've looked at some of the compounding pharmacies in like our region. Um, obviously, I'm extremely familiar with the Cleveland Clinic's compounding pharmacy and a couple others in in the neighborhood. Um, and I don't know where these are coming from, um, which brings us back to Dr. Thacker's point of um, if we are using something compounded, it's because it's a pharmacy and a pharmacist that we know and we trust and is doing the best that they can. Um, on that caveat, back to the, uh, the compounding in general, um, compounding pharmacies don't need to test their products on humans at all. Um, so when we say this, we're, we're saying it, we know there's not a lot of other options. We have this route. We're doing it the safest way possible. 
but we still would probably prefer an FDA regulated thing to replace it. So um, uh, the fact that I don't know where some of these are coming from, um, that part makes me real kind of twitchy and uncomfortable. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Fiffick. And for anyone who's listening in the Northeast Ohio or beyond region who would like to see Dr. Fiffick, you can visit her website, conciergemedicineofwestlake.com or call 440-797-1871. We'll put those in the show notes. And don't forget to miss a future episode if you don't already subscribe to our podcast just click on follow or subscribe it's free we're on all the places you normally would listen to podcasts like apple Podcasts, spotify tune in and if you've enjoyed this episode and you want to help us support the podcast please share it with your friends you can also donate to our nonprofit, or at least leave us a five-star rating Thanks again, and I'll look forward to seeing you back in the Sunflower House. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.